Wow, it sounds like I got a lot to live up to now. Um, you've already experienced the best part of the service with the young people singing. It's going to be all downhill from here. Um, but I'm excited to, really excited to be here. I, um, I have some roots that they go way back. Uh, some roots here at, at Clover Hill Baptist Church. I, I preached here for the first time about 45 years ago. So, yeah, and you're sitting there thinking, he's old as dirt. <laughs> but, yeah, I was just a young man in college, brought a quartet, a uh, vocal quartet up from Bob Jones University. And Pastor Calvin Eves, you know, he was still somewhat of a young man at that time. Uh, but at age, uh, I don't know, I was about 23 at the time. And preached for the first time and then for a few times after that. But it's been a long time since I've been here. And uh, I've been tied up uh, elsewhere. But man, it's just good to be back here with you folks. I, I, I need to tell you that uh, Calvary Baptist Church loves Clover Hill Baptist Church. We've never considered ourselves to be in competition with you folks. We're on the same team. And uh, that's the truth of it all. Um, and, and like I say, I had, uh, w when I was an older teenager and uh, in college, I had a lot of uh, friends my age over here. We used to hang out a lot together. So I feel very close to this church. Some of you I've known for uh, a great number of years. Many of you I've never met. But I do feel, I really do feel at home here uh, this morning. And... I just want to say a word about your, your pastor. I, I praise God. You folks are blessed to have Pastor Mark here. Uh, he didn't ask me to say this, by the way. It's from the heart. Uh, I want to tell you something that really impressed me about the man. Um, more than a year and a half ago, back in January of 2021, my mother passed away at the age of 90. And he had Clover Hill send flowers over to the funeral home. Uh, and, and at that particular point, Brother Mark had not even met me personally. But he just reached out. Uh, he wanted the church to reach out to me in such a gracious way. And I'll tell you, I'll never forget that. That made a deep impression upon me. Uh, and it was, a, <laughs> to say the least, a very good first impression I had about your pastor. Uh, over the past year, I've really gotten to know him, and I've got to tell you, you've, uh, you've got a pastor who is the genuine article. Uh, he has a heart for the Lord, and the thing that stands out uh, about Brother Mark to me is that he's uh, an encourager. You may have different impressions of the man, but it seems like every time I see him, we've... we've had lunch together. We've had the prayer revival together back last November, things like that. But every time he sees me, he's got some word of encouragement, either for me personally or for our church. That's just the kind of guy that he is. But I'm glad uh, that you have such a good pastor here. And I know you love him. And uh, we want to continue to pray for him. I'm glad he's doing so well. Well, if you would, please turn in your Bibles today to Revelation chapter 2. I want to get started before the uh, timer on the back screen starts blinking at me. I would covet your prayers for me as well because I've been going through um, kind of a vestibular migraine type of condition as of late. And it makes me a little bit off balance. Uh, you might say I'm a dizzy blonde. Um, <laughs> But it makes me a little bit off balance, and uh, it gets real foggy up here sometimes. So uh, if in the middle of my preaching I have a long dramatic pause, just wait for it. It'll come back. Uh, I'll remember sooner or later what I was to tell you. But anyway, re anyway Revelation chapter 2. Look at the first verse. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Uh, Ephesus, I've got to tell you, is, uh, if you ever do any study on the book of Ephesus, a very interesting study. 
By the time John writes the book of Revelation, which was around A.D. 90 to 95, uh, it may surprise you to know that this city was already about 1,200 years old. I mean, it was an old city. And, um, and in the Roman Empire, Ephesus was the third largest of all cities. In fact, again, it may impress you to know that uh, there were at least 250,000 people that lived in this ancient city. So it was a large city. Uh, not only that, they were a very wealthy city. Uh, they were north of the Mediterranean Sea and to, to the east of the Aegean Sea that goes up north from the Mediterranean Sea. They were about three miles from the coastline, about 40 miles south of Smyrna. Anyway, the Caister River came uh, inland uh, to the city of Ephesus up to the western gate of the city, and then it took a turn north and went around the city. Uh, but it didn't come all the way to the city. So uh, what was very impressive about Ephesus is that they had a number of men who by hand dug out an artificial port off of the river to bring it all the way up to the western gate of the city. Um, for that reason, it was a city of great, great commerce. In fact, three of the major highways of the day in that part of the ancient world passed within the limits of the city's boundaries. And they did a lot of trade. And um, in fact, one of the largest trades were uh, the making of idols of different mythological gods so people could put those idols in their homes. And this was the central worshiping place of the, of the uh, quote-unquote great goddess Diana. In fact, if you know anything about Diana, they had her temple there, and it was so magnificent that it was known as one of the seven ancient wonders of the ancient world. Uh, so very impressive city, but not just that. This city had a very rich heritage uh, a Christian heritage, I might say. Uh, we know from a study of the book of Acts that Paul founded uh, the church there in Ephesus. Um, and and uh, not only that, but after Paul established the church, um, John, the beloved disciple, before he is exiled to the island of Patmos, lives in Ephesus. And uh, extra biblical history points to the fact that he brought uh, the mother of Jesus Christ, Mary, to live in Ephesus as well. And then, after, and, and then along the way, Timothy becomes the pastor of Ephesus and the satellite churches that Ephesus had started all around it. Um, very, very rich in its heritage. I'm reminded of one thing that the Word of God says, to whom much is given, much shall be required. And, this, and that church had been given much. And uh, they were going to be held to a high standard by God. And I want to say this, Clover Hill's been given much as well. And God's going to hold you accountable. This church has a rich history. It has a prosperous history when it comes to what they've done for the Lord. And... Uh, you, you know what, you know what, folks, God has come to expect a lot out of Clover Hill Baptist Church because of the track record. Now, much has been given, much shall be required. But anyway, we come to verses 2 and 3, and we notice, first of all, the commendations of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, Christ said, uh, by the way, you know, you know the context here, Christ in John, in Revelation chapter 1 appears to the uh, to John in his glorified condition, John falls down like a dead man. And, uh, and then Jesus says, John, I want you to write uh, letters to seven churches here in Asia Minor. And so he is doing that. And it's the Lord speaking here now in verse two. I know thy works. He knows your works. Do I need to say more? That is kind of sobering to me. I'm not always, I may pastor church, but I'm not always proud of who I am. You know, I mean, I'm just like you folks. You're just like me. We battle the same flesh. 
The temptation is, is to commit sin, but to do it in such a way that no man sees. We don't want to ruin our reputation. Sometimes we commit our sins in the darkness of night when no man can see. But God always sees. God always knows, you know, what you're doing. But that works in a positive way as well. When you're serving the Lord, when you're trying to please God, he knows about that too. He's paying attention all the time. And so the Lord says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience. And for my name's sake... Has labored and has not fainted. I, man, I, you know what? That's pretty remarkable. I'm sorry, I get, I get dry. It's a lot of hot air coming out up here, and I have to take a drink every once in a while. Um, I'm impressed by what I see in verses two and three, and yeah, you know, to me, one of the keys. To having a great Christian life and increasing your faith is, and I don't have time to get into this. I am huge. I am very big. In fact, I wear our people out with it. It's, it's one of my pet subjects, but I believe in meditating upon the scripture, not just reading it, not studying it, but I look at every word. I look at every phrase. Uh, I'm going through the New Testament. I'm about four fifths of the way through it. I've been doing it for years, meditating on each verse and then writing down the principle uh, that that it is within the verse. Sometimes it's more than one principle, but uh, in all of that, I want to get to know my God better. Um, and because if you know your God better, you're not going to quit on him. You're not going to get mad at him. You're not going to get bitter against God. You're going to understand him better. And that's extremely important. And one one thing that I learned about the Lord Jesus Christ here is, uh, you know, maybe you haven't been perfect all your life. But in spite of all that, you and I need to understand one thing, that Jesus Christ is still your biggest fan. I mean, he could have started off in verse 4, we're going to get to the rebuke. But that's not the first thing that he comes out with. Hey, by the way, I, uh, this passage helped me when I was a young father. The only thing I knew about fatherhood, when I had, uh, my wife and I had the three children that we had, was basically how my mom and dad had raised me. And uh, as far as any human uh, wisdom... Uh, for whatever that was worth. The rest I had to try to learn from the Bible uh, on the fly, you know, and in a hurry. But somehow I learned early on, and it, and it served me very well, that any time I had to sit down and have a talk with one of my children, and I had to rebuke them and correct them, before I would do that, I would tell them everything that was right about them. Do you handle your children that way? You'll get a lot more mileage out of your correction if you tell them what's right before you tell them what's wrong. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ does here. He's got a complaint, but he says, you know what, folks? You've got an admirable past. The Lord said in so many words, I, I, I'm not sure I, I know of people that are any more hardworking than you are. Uh, you're, you're very patient uh, with new converts. You're very long-suffering. You bring them along in the faith. That, pa- that word patience also means persevering. And I've, I've just preached a series of messages at Calvary on that. And... Uh, I, I don't know if God's gotten a hold of my heart on that, just being able to hang in there when times get tough. But they were, they were being attacked by false teachers. And, um, and so they were very persevering. And not only that, they were very separated. They had high standards. It tells us in verse 6, But, thou, uh, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. It's time for a break. I just remembered something. 
Pastor Mark said I would probably share with you how in the world I wound up here today. Anyway, he called my house this uh, you're sitting there thinking, this, this preacher's kind of odd. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, he heard I had a preacher boy over at the Calvary Baptist Church and wanted if maybe he could sub in for one of the services on Sunday. I said, well, uh, he would, but he's, he's preaching there this Sunday morning because I'm on vacation. But I said, if you're really desperate, I'll come over there and and, and, and preach one of the services for you. And that's, that's how I, some of y'all are obviously not living right and God's punishing you right now. Uh, that's, that's what I get from all of this. Uh, that's why I'm here. But anyway, they were hardworking, patient, separated people. And, uh, and they had, uh, they, they understood one thing, that first generation, that, um, uh, without love, everything was vain. You know what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So much noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I, listen to this, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity or love, it profiteth me nothing. I can't imagine that anybody would give their life to be burned at the stake if they did not love God. But God said, uh, if, if it's possible for somebody to do that without a love, a first love for Jesus Christ, you know what? God could care less about it. And whatever you're doing in service for God, if it's not, first of all, uh, because of the fact that you're motivated by uh, a great love for Jesus Christ, then God doesn't care about that either. That's the truth. And we come to verse 4, and we find after the commendation, the rebuke of the Lord Jesus. He said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. What, what exactly did he mean by first love? I, I think for one thing, uh, what the Lord's saying here is, remember how it was when you first got saved. W what a relief it was. I, I don't know how it was for you, but that's the way it was for me. I got saved at the age of 13 at Calvary Baptist Church. See, my roots go way back at Calvary. And based on the way I behaved as a teenager growing up, it's a wonder I ever ended up becoming the pastor there. But that's, that's God's grace in action, you know. Uh, and he changed me through the years, thankfully. Uh, thankfully, he'll continue to change me because I need it. But anyway, um, I got saved at the age of, uh, of 13 over there and um, grew in my faith in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but I wasn't always motivated uh, by a strong love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I was still figuring a lot of things out. And, but I do remember when I first got saved, I felt like a burden had been lifted off of me. The first time I ever heard the gospel, pardon me, the second time I ever heard the gospel, I got out of my seat and walked down the aisle. And I was taken over into a little side room. And a, and a gentleman, he was elderly then, he's with the Lord now, Aubrey George, lived off of Courthouse Road, took me in a side room and started sharing the gospel with me with tears coming down his face. And that made an impression on me. Uh, when I went back to high school the next year, the, the year before, I had been, you know, somewhat popular with, with my peers and everything. Uh, the next year I went back, things just kind of went downhill for me because something had changed in my life. 
And uh, it, it was the Lord Jesus Christ, and he had made a difference in my life. And, you know, when, when you were first saved, did you have a real, I, I remember my dad got saved. He got saved two months after I was saved. My dad worked on the railroad, the Chessie system, down in old Fulton Bottom uh, on, on the east end of town. But every two or three months, he'd come home uh, drunk. Things could get kind of rough around the house. And uh, when he began to sober up, then he would start crying about how he had been toward mom and myself. And as a young boy, you don't want to see your dad crying. I mean, uh, when my dad was sober, he was the greatest dad in the world. But about every two or three months, I've seen policemen on either side of him walking him up, up to the walk and let him into the house. And, uh, but I want to tell you what, um, my mom and I left town one day and we sicked the, the pastor over on him. And uh, after two hours, my dad accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. My dad used to smoke. My dad used to drink. He used to cuss and he stopped it all overnight. And at Calvary Baptist Church, he, he ended up becoming a deacon. He would sing uh, in, in a quartet. He would drive a, a, a minivan picking up kids for Sunday school. Um, and I'd see him reading the Bible all the time. He, th those were some of the first works. Did it feel like that for you when you first got converted to Christ? Or do we now just take Jesus Christ for granted and the goodness of God for granted? Man alive, when, when, he, when God saved me, he saved me from an eternal hell. And I will be eternally grateful for that. I look forward to the day when I can eternally praise God for that. And do you remember how good it was when you first got saved? But now you know what? We've gotten used to the fact that we're saved. We've, we've gotten used to this routine that we've fallen into. Jesus said, go back to the way it used to be and start over again. The first works also, and we find a hint of it in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15. When Paul writes to the young church and he commends them for their faith in Christ and their love for Christ and their love for all the saints. We know that after Pentecost, uh, some other things that characterized every church was a love for the word of God, a love for prayer, a love for soul winning. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, the pastor of Ephesus in, in 2 Timothy 4.8, and he talks about a love for Christ appearing. See, I think all these go into having a first love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It means that out of all the things in this world that we love and all the people that we love in this world, Jesus is preeminent. He is our first love. He is our primary love. Is that true of us here today? So he says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Folks, you know, that is the beginning of the end if you don't correct it. One thing you might miss by reading this passage is that John is writing to the second generation of believers now in the church of Ephesus. The first generation loved Jesus Christ above all. But if there's anything perhaps they did wrong, uh, it, it was the fact that maybe they didn't uh, effectively communicate to their children what it was that drove them to do what they did for Christ, and that was the love they had for him. I wonder if our children and grandchildren can see that the thing that drives us more than anything is our uh, unquenchable, undying love for Jesus Christ. See, the problem is that this second generation, 
They were patient. They were hardworking. They were separated. They had high Christian standards. But they were just going through the motions because that's what their dads and moms had done. They were, they were mimicking their parents, but without the love for Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, folks, that is something that can sneak up on a church. And, you, and we better have our eyes wide open on the lookout for it. You need to check your hearts today. Is Jesus Christ still your first love? You know, um, when we leave our first love, it leads to all kinds of theological, moral, and spiritual problems. And that brings us to the exhortation in verse 5, where Jesus told John to write, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You know, Jesus Christ said, I, I'm just going to remove my power from the church, and uh, the blessing of my presence in the church. You know, what does it, what does it mean to really repent? Anyway, if we've left our first love, the thing we need to do is to repent. And um, when I was, let me share this with you first of all. When I was in seminary, um, I had to spend some extra time in college because I didn't change my major to Bible until my senior year uh, when I sensed God's call to preach on my life. So uh, I stayed for a few more years and, and went through seminary to get grounded, uh, better grounded. And um, I had to, because of that, I had to take a few courses in, in church history. And I remember Dr. Edward Pernosian uh, standing before the class one day and he said, uh, one thing, gentlemen, you need to understand is that uh, there are many different cycles that play themselves out in church history. And they always repeat themselves. And I found that very interesting. And, and he, he went on to say, this is the one that you find most often. When you take one step away from the reproach of the cross, your love for God's going to be replaced by love for this world. That's step number one. Have y'all left your first love? Have you taken just one step away from the reproach of the cross? If you don't repent at that point, then the second thing, once your love for God is replaced by love for this world, there's going to be, secondly, a compromise in your standards. If you do not repent at that point, then thirdly, there's going to be a compromise or corruption in your doctrine. And fourthly, uh, if you don't repent at that point, then all-out spiritual and moral corruption sets in, and then after that, apostasy. In other words, getting to the point where you f completely deny those truths that you once stood for. See, uh, that process can start in such a small, seemingly innocent way. Just cooling off a little bit. Rarely do you see this cycle played out in one individual life. It usually plays out in two to three generations. Are y'all still with me this morning? If you, and I'm hitting below the belt now, I admit this, but let me say it this way. If you really love your children, if you really love your grandchildren, then you will not leave your first love for Jesus Christ and you will not take one step away from the reproach of the cross. 
Because see, all the first generation has to do is just to cool off on their first love a little bit. The second generation comes along and goes through the motions like the folks in Ephesus but without a love for Jesus Christ. And the third generation looks at the second generation and, and says to themselves, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. They're going through the motions, but they don't love God. And so they forsake God altogether. That's how it happens. And we've seen that played out in many a family. So he says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. I don't know, what, what, is, what does real repentance look like? The best lecture I ever heard the whole time I was in college was out of the book of Judges. And um, in Judges chapter 10... Well, you know, in the book of Judges, for several times, they, the, the Jewish people go through a cycle. They leave their first love for God. That love is replaced by love for the world. Then they bring in idols, and they start compromising their standards and, and compromising their beliefs. God takes them into captivity, and the Jewish people begin to mourn. And, and to cry out to God to please forgive them and restore them, and God does. This happens several times, but you get to chapter 10, and this is chilling to me. In Judges 10, beginning, uh, beginning at verse 10, And the children of God Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, and from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Maonites did oppress you? And ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, wherefore I will deliver you no more. When I heard that as a young man in seminary in that classroom, man, chills went up and down my body. I don't know how it affects you right now, but God had had enough People coming to him, um, you know, every week, uh, repenting before God with no intention of truly permanently changing. No change of mind. And God says, you know what, I've had it. Do the best you can. Man, I hope he never says that to us, don't you? But listen to what follows. In verse 14, God says, go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you at the time of your tribulation. And then this in verse 15, and the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned. Well, we've heard that before. Are they going to say this? Do thou unto us whatever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. That's true repentance. When you get to the point that you're so desperate to be forgiven, you come to God and, and not only with the attitude that, God, I want you to forgive my sins, but whatever price I have to pay to be restored to you, do what you will and what you need to do. And we need that kind of repentance if we're to be revived again as we sung about this morning. That is a big part of revival. Well, it's 11.59 and one minute that it's going to start blinking. So, I better close this thing down here. But remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. In other words, I'm just going to close your church down. 
Oh, your doors may remain open. People may still come, but nothing will be accomplished that will last for eternity without the power of God. Needless to say, the church of Ephesus never totally repented. And this is the interesting part. You, uh, Recall earlier how I mentioned they had dug out a harbor off the Caister River to come all the way up to the city. Well, about 20 years after Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus, uh, that artificial port or harbor be, uh, started the process of silting. Uh, the waters began to recede. And the sands from the Caster River started flooding into that harbor. You know what happened? The, um, a, a marshland was formed and hordes of mosquitoes came in. Now, if you do some research, you can Google this. You, you can find it. I read this a long time ago in a couple of other books. But that harbor began to fill in. And uh, became a marshland. I don't know if you've ever spent any time on the Outer Banks. And, um, you know, you got the sound side and you got the ocean side. But you got that. I've been to Rodanthe, a little narrow strip of land there. But, every, you know, every night at peak season, these trucks come through and they spray all this mosquito spray up in the air. Well, let me tell you what. The mosquitoes came in so bad that malaria broke out on several occasions. And the inhabitants of the city of Ephesus had to leave and move further inland. Today, of course, Ephesus, ancient Ephesus would be in Turkey. Uh, today, there's a small town on the old Ephesus site of about 35,000 people. But needless to say, because they did not fully repent as a result, today, there's only a memory of a great city, and all that you'll find there are ruins uh, in the midst of a small town, and, once, and where once a great church stood, now lies only a memory of a church that left its first love. What will it be for Clover Hill Baptist Church this morning? Will this church continue to thrive for another gener generation that all depends on you and what you do with the love of Christ? Not only his love for you, but your love for him. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing the word of God with your people today. And I pray that uh, you would place conviction where conviction is needed. And if there's someone here today that needs to repent and make things right with thee, I pray that you would find with them, within them a willing heart. And Lord, if there's someone here who has never experienced the love of God by being converted to Jesus Christ, we pray that this would be the day of his or her salvation. But Lord, in this moment, defeat the devil and take the victory for thyself. I pray that you would be glorified and Christ would be lifted up now in this moment. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.